We are at a critical juncture where our ability to develop medical innovations is, in many instances, being held back by our lack of basic biological knowledge. The amount the drug industry spent per uh, FDA drug approval doubled roughly every nine years between 1950 and 2010. That's something called E-Room's law. So the data on this is actually quite clear. Only 1.2% of preclinical drug assets make it all the way through to an FDA approved drug, which means most small biotech company assets fail. So I want you to think about this for a minute. In what other field of endeavor could a 1.2% success rate ever be considered acceptable? Over the last century, we made a lot of progress in the biology of viruses, bacteria, and surgery procedures. But the biology of age-related diseases and aging is still lacking on that, and we still don't understand it very well. So the Thalian Initiative is a multi-year effort to fill in the gaps that we know we have in aging biology. And the reason we're focused on these areas is because this is where we have the most opportunity for medical innovation and for actually producing uh, legitimate therapies. So the problem is what's happening at the moment is we have lots of people uh, kind of understandably uh, jumping on this uh, translational drug development bandwagon. People are making kind of best guesses really about underlying mechanisms of aging, which really uh, kind of glosses over the fact that not enough effort and time has been uh, invested in understanding the core biology of aging. And really it's for that reason that one sees, and I would predict one will continue to see, high failure rates in translational research. By taking a few steps back and evaluating biology using a first principles approach, we believe we can improve the success of translational research and ultimately break through many of the factors contributing to Irum's law. In biology there's still this problem, even in the big data part of biology, that we, A, we don't have enough data and we don't have high quality data. And we realize that and this is also an impediment to making progress in aging biology. And the way we think we could actually solve that is by building better tools that can visualize and show us more things that we currently cannot even see. Our project aims to develop innovative approaches to analyze metabolic shifts in aging. The three primary aims are robust quantification, single cell level spatial analyses, and new AI technologies to discover uh, the vast majority of metabolites where we still don't know what they are. Our ability to visualize living biological samples at high spatial resolution is very limited. We are pioneering the next generation stimulated Raman scattering microscopy for super resolution imaging. So if you think about it, nature and evolution already figured out how to extend lifespan in mammals. Mammals that live one or two years, like rodents and mice, and then there are other mammals that live 200 years, like whales. And we are humans are in the middle. The question is why? What did nature and evolution do to accomplish that? Long-lived and disease-resistant animals offer us a unique opportunity to study the biology of aging. By exploring these species, we can gain fundamental insights into mechanisms of lifespan control. Speaking of nature's inspiration, we need to look no further than our own bodies. Germ cells reset biological age during embryogenesis, offering a blueprint for rejuvenation. This process clears cellular damage and restores useful function, offering an avenue for potential rejuvenation therapies. Going beyond learning from nature, our next step will be to engineer it. Our synthetic biology group will focus on fundamental understanding of aging in the most basic organism. So biology and silico models and simulations are far less developed than those for physics and chemistry. And yet there's a large amount of biological knowledge that could be modeled to allow for better interpretation of data. We're assembling those models and we're developing a computational biology framework for enhancing their accuracy, but we'll also be taking the outputs from the other Thalian projects to further enhance their capabilities. How we think about the Thalian Initiative is akin to the CERN of aging biology. The experiments that we propose are biological mega-projects that are bigger than what one lab could do, bigger than one nature paper or what one grant would be funding. Of the basic sciences, biology is the least understood. We lack the frameworks and models to describe and predict therapeutic outcomes. Biology needs to reach a level of predictability similar to physics and chemistry if we hope to advance medical innovation. So our goal is to directly contribute to changing that 1.2% FDA success rate to a 6 or 7% success rate. And we think that kind of 5x improvement is doable within a 10 to 15 year time frame. If you think of this like an investor in terms of value for money, um, if you look at all the money that's been spent on preclinical drug assets that have never made it through to a FDA approved drug and have there's no financial exit, the cost of funding the Thalian Initiative, even as a philanthropic endeavor, 
is a small price to pay to get a field-wide improvement in efficiency and predictability. There are a few areas of philanthropy where you can have more of an impact than in medical innovation, especially when it applies to human health span and lifespan.